appreciate your presence this morning. Even though it looks like our number's down a little bit, uh, some sicknesses and maybe some rain kept some people away. But uh, glad that you're here. I encourage you to be making your plans for the lectureship that's going to be coming up in June. It's not too far along, away from us. And we will be studying uh, realized eschatology and showing the error of that way. Uh, for those who can help with the electorship meal funds, uh, give that money to Denise so that uh, we'll have plenty of money to go buy food for those who are here as we prepare meals for them. <coughs> but you might uh, be inviting some others to not only learn the error of realized eschatology, but realize the, to be able to teach them the proper views of last things. Eschatology very simply means study of last things, and so uh, while realized eschatology is wrong, we'll be showing also the proper eschatology that we should have. In Philippians or Philemon, the 16th verse, Paul, in writing to this beloved brother Philemon, on behalf of a runaway slave Onesimus who has become a Christian now, and Paul is sending him back to Philemon, encourages Philemon to accept him back, not now as a servant, literally a slave there, but above a slave, a brother beloved, especially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Last Sunday morning, we began looking at this idea of allowing Onesimus to represent any church member, any member of the Lord's church. He is a representative brother in that sense because he was a brother beloved. He was a, a beloved brother because we have the same father. Uh, we looked at the brotherhood of man implies the kinship of the human relation of the human family, that we all go back and can trace our lineage to Noah and then on back into, of course, Adam and Eve, and Eve being the mother of all living. And so there's a universal kinship of the human family, but there's even more so a kinship from a spiritual standpoint. We are brethren in the Lord. And so, as such, we have a likeness of our Father. We partake of His divine nature. And we do that by allowing the Spirit's Word to uh, grow in our hearts and we become like and we resemble thus each other because, or in those moral and spiritual qualities, because we're living according to the Spirit's instructions. But we are members of the same family as a result. This family is the church, the household of God. In 1 Timothy, the third chapter, and verse 15, Paul would write, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. And so Paul is setting forth for us this consideration that the church is the house of God. Well, in dealing with the house of God, we're dealing thus with a family, a family situation. And thus all of those who are members of the church are members of that same spiritual family. Peter would state in much the same way in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5 that ye, are, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house 
a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Here is a spiritual house. It's in a similar fashion to a physical home, a physical house that comprises a family. Well, that spiritual house comprises a spiritual family. It is the family of God. And we get into that family through that new birth process. Even as, from a physical standpoint, we become a member of a house through physical birth, so we undergo a spiritual birth to get into this spiritual house. That spiritual birth Jesus talks about in John 3, verse 3 and verse 5 in particular, that it is a birth of water in the Spirit. And when we study that, that's not a baptism of water and a baptism of spirit. Instead, these two elements, water and spirit, make up the new birth. Baptism in water is a part of that new birth process. That's the water aspect because the only thing in the scriptures really that embraces the idea of water is that of baptism. And so, there is a washing of water by the word, as would talk, be talked about in uh, Titus 3 and verse 5 and 1 Peter 1, verse 22 and 23. There's also that aspect of spirit, that element of spirit in that new birth process. That element of spirit is the instructions of the spirit. The Spirit has given us instructions in relationship to that spiritual family and becoming a part of that spiritual family. And how we are to get into that church, which is the household of God. It is through that act of baptism, but it's the Spirit giving us the instructions. And so, the Spirit, through the Word of God, acting through that agency of the Word of God, instills into man spiritual life. As Peter and as affirmed by Jesus, uh, the words of Jesus are spirit and they are life in John the sixth chapter. Oh, we have spirit in life. How? As a result of the Word of God. Because the Word of God instills faith within us. The, Faith comes by the hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10 and verse 17. And so we have the word of God producing faith. And again, that's what John 20th chapter and verse 30 and 31 would affirm. That many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, and that believing you might have life through his name. What is it? The Spirit is instructing John and inspiring John to write down certain words. So when we read that, those words that John has written, and that word coming from God, it instills into us faith. Faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what's the end result of that? Life is. So that they might have life and not have it more abundantly. And so the end result of that is life that comes from the words of the Spirit. And so the Spirit is producing spiritual life in man through the Word of God when we are baptized in water and then we are born into, and through those, that process, we are born into the family of God. That's what Acts the second chapter is all about. When you have the Holy Spirit coming to the apostles, for the purpose of, as we would read in John the 14th chapters through the 16th chapter, to guide man into all truth, to show them things to come, and to bring to remembrance all that Jesus has said. Holy Spirit comes to those apostles. There is a gathering of the crowd. Some of them mocked, and so Peter begins a sermon. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, 
but it is the outpouring of the Spirit as prophesied by Joel. Joel in Joel 2, verses 28 through 32. And he quotes that. With the end result, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What is it? They're going to have life. And he continues to show how that while they had crucified the Son of God, God had raised him from the dead as in fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. Now then, he concludes this, it comes to a conclusion, verse 33, or verse 36, that therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, God hath made both Lord and Christ. The people were pricked in their hearts, and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? What had happened? What had taken place? The Spirit was instructing Peter to speak those words, and through that, those words, faith was instilled in the Jews. Faith that Jesus Christ is the Christ, the Son of the living God. And now then they're asking, what shall we do to be saved? Well, he tells them to repent, be baptized for the remission of your sins, verse 38. Those that gladly received the word, what word? That word that came from the Spirit. When they accepted that word, when they received that word, they were baptized. And there were, the same day they were added unto them, about 3,000 souls. But we find in verse 47 that they were added to the church daily, those that were being saved. And thus by those Spirit's words, the Spirit, through the agency of the Word of God, instilling faith in individuals, they obeying that word and being baptized in water for the forgiveness of their sins, they were added to the church, which is the house of God. They had gone through that new birth process and now they are part of the family of God. And when we go through that exact same process, hearing the word of God, word of God that comes from well, the Bible, because those holy men of God wrote down what we need to have today to come to a knowledge of Jesus as being the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it will instill faith in us so that we can have the exact same understanding. For example, Paul had when he was inspired. His message came directly from God, Galatians 1, verse 10 through 12. But he says, when you read what I write, you can have my understanding of the mystery of Christ. Ephesians 3, verses 4 and verse 5. And so that spirit, through those written words, instilling faith within man today, so that when he obeys the gospel of Jesus Christ in being baptized, he enters into that spiritual family. He's gone through that new birth process. He's now a member of the church. He is a part of that family of God, the household of God. But now then, being a part of that family of God, a part of that household of God, and that song that we sang, that I hope you have paid attention to the words, the, the song that we sang, we are part of the family. Yes, we are. That family of God, the household of God. But as such... There are certain responsibilities and privileges that we have as members of that family. First, we eat at the same table. In Luke, the 22nd chapter, verse 29 and verse 30, Jesus says, I appoint unto you a kingdom as my Father hath appointed unto me that ye may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. We have the opportunity to eat and drink at the table of the Lord. What is that? That's the Lord's table. When we, upon the first day of the week, as we see the first century church doing, who's the first century church? That's the church the family of God, of those individuals in the first century. What did they do? Well, we find them that upon the first day of the week, 
when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preaching to them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight, Acts 20 and verse, verse 7. So here's the church, the family of God, coming together on the first day of the week to partake of the Lord's Supper, to break bread as the figure is used. What are we doing? We are communing with God. We're communing with each other. Our minds, as instructed by Jesus, are to go back to the, the sacrifice that Jesus made for our sins. Sometimes we hear it, prayers prayed in relationship to the partaking of the Lord's Supper to uh, remember the death, burial, and resurrection. But it's not that. It is to remember the death of Christ. That here, the bread that we eat, an unleavened bread. Why? Because this was the time of Passover when Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper. And they would have had no leaven in the house at that time. It would have been forbidden. And so Jesus used an unleavened bread. And so we use unleavened bread today as we eat that Lord's Supper in remembrance of the body of Christ. Then we use fruit of the vine. And I just, as an aside here, a lot of times we have individuals who will say uh, wine and use that term. But yet the scriptures always refer to it as fruit of the vine. Wine and you need to understand the biblical term wine does not always mean alcoholic wine. It can refer to the wine that's still in the grape while it's on the tree or on the vine. And thus, that juice that's in the, the grape that's still on the vine is called wine. Freshly spread squeezed or coming out of that grape, the juice would be wine, no alcoholic content. Or wine could be used, yes, for that which had alcoholic content. It's a broad term that embraces all of those things. Context determines which one it's dealing with. But the scriptures don't really use wine in relationship to the Lord's Supper. It states the fruit of the vine. I think it's interesting that he does that, that God does that, maybe to offset some of the problems that we've seen arise through the years of some who argue that we have to have wine or alcoholic content on the Lord's Supper. But instead, it's fruit of the vine. And in that fruit of the vine, we're remembering the blood that Jesus, Jesus shed on Calvary's tree. Our minds, as we partake of that bread and fruit of the vine thus, are to go back to the, to the sacrifice that Jesus made upon the cross. And as we eat together of that bread and fruit of the vine, Paul would refer to it as we have fellowship in that. We are communing one with another in 1 Corinthians 10th chapter. In the, 12th, in the 11th chapter then, he goes into a fuller discussion of that Lord's Supper and the abuses that were taking place in the church at Corinth in relationship to the Lord's Supper. But he says in the 10th chapter that it is a fellowship, it is a communion that we have with Christ with God, with one another. We are in fellowship one with another. What is it? We are eating and drinking at the table of the Lord in fellowship with Christ, with one another, because our minds are going back to what he did. Our minds are centered, all of us together, in relationship to the same thing. And so, yes, it is a communing with one another, eating at that table. We, what a wonderful privilege that God has given unto us. And Jesus instituting the supper. 
It says that he gave thanks for each one of these emblems, the bread and the fruit of the vine. No doubt in that giving thanks, it wasn't just simply for the fact that they had some bread there and had some fruit of the vine there. But no doubt it was that God had instituted that supper that we would have available to us to commune one with another. And there is a thankfulness in that. Thus, for the bread and the fruit of the vine, thanking God for providing us that opportunity to eat and drink together in his kingdom, one with another. And thus we have a family meal. We are eating at that same table. But then also, we wear the same name. In Isaiah, the 62nd chapter, in verse 2, Isaiah prophesies of a time that the Gentiles shall see thy righteousness and all kings thy glory and thou shalt be called by a new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. He sets forth a time frame in relationship to this giving of a new name by God. And when I say that I recognize that there are some who believe that this name was given in derision by the enemies of Christ. But that's not what Isaiah prophesies. Isaiah prophesies that this name would be given to, the, to us by God. And we'll come back to that in a minute. But this is a name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. Now as we go through the scriptures thus, we have to find a time in which is going to come the Gentiles see the righteousness of God. They're going to hear about how they can be made righteous, how they can be made right with God. And if you look at Peter's sermon to the household of Cornelius in Acts the 10th chapter, you will find Peter setting forth that righteousness when he says that he that doeth righteousness or worketh righteousness will be accepted of him. Thus, here's the righteousness of God. The Gentiles seeing that righteousness. It had to come after that period of time. So any name that was used in relationship to this family of God that was used prior to this time would not have been that new name. They had been called by many terms, disciples, brethren, and other such terms, but those terms were not new. Even though, during the Old Testament, they were called those things. And so, we're looking for something new, though, a new name. It has to come after this time, not before it. And the kings sing the glory. And certainly through that, the first few years uh, of the church, as recorded in Acts chapters 2 through chapter 10, we see the very fact that the kings do see the glory of God. And so we come to Acts 10 and that preaching of the gospel and that righteousness to the Gentiles and then we can start looking for this new name which the mouth of the Lord shall name. And we come to chapter 11 and verse 26. And it's talking about here, here's uh, Barnabas. And he goes and he finds Saul of Tarsus who later becomes the apostle Paul. It says that when Barnabas had found Saul, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass a whole year that they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Well, here's the first time now that this word, this term is used for the disciples. They'd been called disciples before, but they had never been called Christians prior to this time. It is now after... The Gentiles had seen the righteousness of God, the king's thy glory, 
And now then we have a new name, the very first time it's being used, Acts 11 and verse 26, and it's the name Christian. As I said, there are some who come to Acts 11 and verse 26, and they read this, the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, and they say, well, that's a term that the enemies of Christianity used for those who were Christians. They use this term in derision for those individuals. And so, some have questioned whether the term Christian is a fulfillment of, of Isaiah 62 and verse 2. But yet, if you look and study at the word called, the, Christ, the disciples were called Christians. The term that's translated called here is a term that, it, that has within it the idea that this is a divine calling. It is not a calling of derision, as they would claim. It is a divine calling. God is calling them Christians, and it takes place first in Antioch. After the Gentiles have seen the righteousness of God and the king's eye glory, now then we have a new name. First time that it's used, Antioch. And it is a calling that is a divine calling. Thus, the mouth of the Lord shall name. What is it? It is the name Christian. That's the name that we should be using today. And yet you listen to the denominational world, and that's not the names that they will use. Instead, they'll use Episcopalian or Baptist or Methodist or Catholic or all of these other names. Yet, here's the name that God has given unto his family, and it is the name of Christian. And when you look at that name of Christian, it certainly implies some important principles. It is, and the very basic meaning is, Christ-like. Here is someone who is like unto Christ. He's going to act like Christ. He's going to follow Christ. All of those things are going to be included in the aspect of being a Christian. And so we're going to study Christ and what he did upon this world, how he lived his life, the attributes that he had, the attitudes that he possessed. And we're going to try to fashion ourselves like unto him. Remember what Paul would say to the Galatian brethren in chapter 4 and verse 19. My little children of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. And he would write to the Philippians in chapter 2 and verse 5. Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. We have his mind. He is to be formed in us. And thus Paul would write of himself in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. What is it? I have the mind of Christ. I'm allowing Christ to be formed in me so that it is no longer I who live, but it's Christ living in me. That's what being a Christian is all about. We have his mind. We allow him to be formed in us so that when people see us, they see Christ. Even as Christ would be able to say, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. People in the world should be able to see the, the Christian and say, when they see us, they've seen Christ. Can they, though? Or do they see someone that's just like everyone else? Just like the people in the world, and there's no real difference and distinction between us and the person of the world. We are part of a family, yes. 
And that name that we are to wear is the name of Christian. But it's not simply a name to wear. It is something that we are to be like. It's something that we are to live like. Because we are to be like Christ. And then if you study the aspect of the term Christian, and thus the term Christ itself, we recognize that that term Christ means anointed one, the anointed one. Because as we study the Old Testament, we find that there are three offices that were appointed offices. Those offices of priest, kings, and prophets. During the Old Testament times, one individual would not hand, and could not hold all three of those offices. For one thing, the kingly office came from the tribe of Judah. The priestly office came from the tribe of Levi. And so you could not have one person holding all three offices. But in Christ, you do have someone holding all three offices. Priest, prophet, and king. We are to be Christians like Christ. As he was appoint, anointed priest, prophet, and king, we are to be anointed priest, prophet, and king. We are priest, or at first we're prophet, in that we are speaking forth for God. We don't have inspiration and are not inspired as the apostles were, for example, as Christ was. But we can speak an inspired word that has been written down for us in the New Testament. How many times do you hear in the denominational world and it's crept over into the church, let me give you my testimony. What do they mean by that? I asked that just this week. What do they mean by that? Well, it means very simply, I'm going to tell you what God has done for me. What we need to be doing is, here's what the Bible says. Why? Because that's the testimony of God, His testimony, and we give His word. We give His testimony. I'm not a witness for Christ. I don't meet those qualifications. Neither do you. Neither does anyone else in the world today. But what do they mean by it? Well, I'm going to witness what Christ has done for me, and I'm going to give you thus my testimony as to how I feel and what I've come, or what's happened to me in my life. And hopefully you'll become whatever they are because of this testimony that I'm going to give you. If we're wanting people to become Christians, what are we going to give them? We're going to give them the testimony of Christ and what Christ is and what His attributes and all of those things about Christ so that Christ can be formed in them even as Christ is to be formed in us. That's being a prophet of God today. Not inspired, no, but setting forth that inspired word as recorded in the pages of the New Testament. We are priests of God today. The individual priesthood of every Christian needs to be recognized. Yes, I am a priest. You are a priest. Everyone who is a Christian is a priest. Now then, as a priest, and if you go back to what we mentioned in 1 Peter five and verse, or 2 and verse 5, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house. There's that house that we've been talking about, that family of God. What is the next statement? A holy priesthood. Well, there's the priesthood of God. And everyone who is a part of that family of God is a priest of God. And what is that priest to do? He's to offer up spiritual sacrifices. The sacrifices of the Old Testament by, that were offered by the priest were dead animals. We are to offer up living sacrifices that are spiritual. It is a living body. Ourselves, we are to place on that altar so that it is, we are crucified with Christ so that Christ can be formed in us. So it's not us that live, but it's Christ living in us. 
Hebrews 13, verses uh, 15 and 16. He would emphasize that here's by him, therefore let us offer up the sacrifices of praise to God continually. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name, but to do good and to communicate or to have fellowship, forget not. For with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Here's the sacrifices that we offer. Why? Because we are priests today. Are you acting as the priest of God today? If you're a Christian, you're supposed to be, and you will be. And then you're kings, even as Christ is a king. He was raised up and ascended back on high to sit down at the right hand of the majesty on, uh, on high that all power, all majesty has been given unto him, all authority, and he is, now sits and rules so that he is the king of kings and lord of lords, the blessed and only pontitate, 1 Timothy 6 and verse 15. Now, what is that? That's ruling. But we are rulers as well. We are ruling with Christ. We're ruling over sin. We're ruling over Satan. We do not allow sin to reign in our mortal bodies. A person in the world allows sin to reign in his mortal body. The Christian doesn't. He's ruling over sin. He's ruling over Satan. Satan has no hold on the Christian because he's living after Christ. He has allowed Christ to be formed in him. It's not he who lives, but it's Christ living in him. And so Christ, Satan has no hold on him because he's a Christian. He's ruling over Satan. And thus Paul would say, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Romans 8 and verse 37. We are rulers. Ruling and reigning with Christ. And because we are ruling and reigning with Christ over sin, sin and over Satan, we have the hope of an eternity with God, the Father, in heaven. Now if you don't have that hope this morning, because you're not being a Christian, all that it involves, all that it means, why not become such this morning? Go through that new birth process that we mentioned to become a member of that family of God. And then as a Christian, living the Christian life, that name that God has given unto us and that we're going to use, if you need to come this morning, and we would encourage you to do so as we stand and sing the invitation song.